Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Data Unchained. I'm your host, Molly Presley. If you haven't listened to our podcast before, let me tell you a little bit about what this podcast is all about. As the world has become more decentralized, we've seen data centers complemented by cloud, we've seen workforces start to become more scattered around the world, and with the advent of things like edge computing, IoT and sensor data, data is being created in a lot of different locations. In this decentralized world, getting data to these remote workers, distributed applications, and different cloud services is really a challenge. Data Unchained digs into both the challenges as well as the solutions to make data an asset as a global resource. Today's guest, I think, will really have a great perspective on a lot of these topics. Yulia Kachova, which I probably didn't get that perfect, um, <laughs> is the co-founder and CEO of Masthead Data. Yulia, welcome for to the podcast. Hi, Molly. Thank you so much for inviting me and having a Do you mind correct here. my pronunciation? <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm Yulet Kacho, but it's so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yourself before we talk about masthead data and just data in general. Um, tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, so I'm Yulia, born and raised in Ukraine, currently living in Ontario, Canada. Um, started to do data product management back in 2016 way long before when industry recognized the need for data product managers. Uh, yeah, um, started my career in web analytics and uh, currently doing everything that is not related too much to data product management as a CEO, but very much want to focus on uh, product management as well. Yeah. <laughs> So can you tell us, because I think the concept of data product management is new to a lot of people, what is that? Oh, this is a great question. Um, So if you think about data, and um, in a way that uh, data mesh frames it, data becomes a product to organizations. And it not necessarily have a UI or something tangible around it, Mm -hmm. but it has a lot of requirements to it. And if you think about um, data as a product, it has to have some criteria around it. Um, First of all, it has to be discoverable by data consumers. Uh, It needs to be actionable so they can put it in use. And also, it has to be trustworthy. And if any of those is missing, let's say they cannot put it into use, any other criteria doesn't matter. So the same with trustworthy and and uh, discover it. Like if their data exists somewhere, uh, they should have put that in use and it trustworthy. But if they cannot discover it. It still does matter. So data product managers, in fact, ensures that data could be actionable to uh, data consumers and in our, it was in the organizations. And their prime goal uh, is to ensure that organizations get uh, value from this data. In short, yeah, there are a lot of different aspects, but uh, What is very special about data product managers is that they uncover the use cases uh, for data consumers and basically connect data producers, data engineers, and data consumers together um, and make sure the data is uh, is used in a way. I think it's... It's fascinating to see the world evolve and how companies think about products that, you know, first it was something physical. I, you know, they manufacture a car and that was the product. And then software started to be a product. And now this data that's being generated from so many places is such a valuable product. And the roles in the organization change as you think about how do you monetize, contain, understand what you have? And the, I, I had actually, before talking to you, had not heard of the term data product manager, and it makes so much sense to me. So I wanted to just highlight that a bit before we jumped really into the show. Um, so Masthead Data, you're the co-founder and CEO. Tell us a little bit about what does the company do? What brought about your um, desire to found the company? Uh, okay, so this is a great question as well. So. Uh, at Masshead, we are building 
a observability platform for data engineers. In short, you can think about us as a data dog, Splunk, or new relic, but for data engineers instead of okay. software engineers. So what we do, we observe data ecosystem and solutions within the data engineers environment to make sure they are performing as expected from, let's say, uh, within Google Cloud um, ecosystem, it could be uh, a uh, source data from uh, Postgres uh, to Google BigQuery and, and Looker dashboards. So we observe everything that is happening in between and in those system, systems to ensure that data consumers are receiving tr trustworthy data. Um, if we break it down, we observe dashboards, tables, pipelines, um, modeling solutions, details, whatever is in data engineers ecosystem to ensure that everything is happening as expected, no errors or anomalies are happening um, within that ecosystem, yeah. So how do you set this up? It sounds like observing so many data sources could be complex, or maybe the simple fact that you set up masthead gives you observability to everything. It simplifies things because you've once you've done it once, you know where everything is. But how do you set this up and connect to the data sources? This is basically a question because if you think about data engineers environment, there are lots of different systems in it, which actually makes it hard to understand how everything is uh, inter interconnected. So what we do, we at MassHead, we are focusing uh, to connect data engineers environment at the log and metadata level. Okay. And this is very much different to any other data observability solution on the market because those solutions are focused on what is happening in tables. And basically those are SQL first solutions that would need to have read access to clients' data in order to perform scheduled monitorings and run scheduled SQL queries on clients' data. And we don't do so. We ingest on the logs and metadata that ensures full coverage of data engineers' environment and also ensures real-time notifications, not, about, not only about um, anomalies in tables, but also errors and anomalies within pipelines. So this is what makes us different. And if we're talking about the connection to data engineers environment, it also less intrusive exactly, than when we're definitely. talking about SQL first solutions because we mm -hmm. don't need read access or God forbid edit edit access to clients' <laughs> data. Yeah. So Basically, once we came in, we take retrospective looks, we understand how data is flowing within the system um, using retrospective metadata, where we are able to visualize uh, data lineage on a column level, we're able to understand how much it costs to run any pipeline or model, and we also know how every table within client's uh, data warehouse like used to behave from retrospective data, and that is used to build machine learning model to anticipate any anomalies in future. Uh, so yeah, talking about setup, it's much more frictionless than when we are talking about SQL first solutions. If that uh, makes, makes sense. Absolute sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And seems the barrier to entry of an organization approving you being in the environment must be lower because you're not needing access to all those systems, sources, data well, directly. Well, this is also, I'm glad we touched that because, you know, being a uh, founder of an old, like, early stage startup, obviously, we still have this question, like, at every step of the, you know, of the deal, let's say, was any new organization that is uh, interested in MassHead, I would have the same question from every touch point, either it's data engineer, a lawyer, whoever, you know, is involved in this decision mm -hmm. maker, mm -hmm. ma decision making, they will ask me the same question. What date, like, what data do you query? And I need to explain to every single person that we don't touch your data. And yeah, that yeah. sounds really, you know, how do you say it? it sounds 
just too good to be true for them. <laughs> so I always need to overcome this barrier, explaining how we operate. Uh, but this is very much what we believe in because none of the system that doesn't ingest data in clients' warehouse shouldn't have read or edit access to it. And because we do not do anything to data, we just monitor that non-intrusively, we do need any permissions to do so. Uh, so we just uh, operate based on logs and metadata. Really interesting. So if you're in an environment where maybe you have five data engineers working together, um, is your deployment and information unique to each of their environments? So you're looking at data engineer number one's logs, workload, data sets that they're connected to, and it will be custom to them, the types of information you're providing, which would be different than what engineer number two is looking at, or do you provide it at an organizational level? How, how does that work? Okay, this is also a nice question. Um, so we I'm actually very that... interested. <laughs> I find oh, this yeah. like, concept so, no <laughs> so novel and interesting. Uh, yeah, so if you think of it, if you think about observability, uh, we also believe it have to be end-to-end. -end. Because if a solution provide observability for a specific data set, it doesn't necessarily mean there is observability because it, it turns out to be monitoring, if you think of it. Let's say you have different data sets. One data set have data for marketing team, the other one is production team, the, the third one is a sales team. But both of uh, like three of those data sets are sourced from let's say, I don't know, like Postgres. And if there is anomaly, uh, and if we are observing, let's say, only a sales team data set for a specific metrics, and we discover there is anomaly, it also means that the anomaly is going to be fixed only in that particular data set. But the source of truth where we had the anomaly would also impact other data sets. So at MassHead, what we believe is that data observability should be end-to-end. -end. And this is a big cha challenge because when we're talking about SQL-first solutions, normally organization would implement them on a specific data set, which doesn't necessarily provide a full coverage. And then it couldn't be a data observability because it's too narrow and it has nothing to do with entire data engineer environment. So at MassHead, we truly believe that understanding how data is moving, what is impacted, and having this observability from production sources like Postgres, MySQL, uh, like, yeah, MySQL, upstream down to the Looker dashboard is something necessary for organizations that wants to ensure their data is reliable at every single step. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Um, so for myself and other listeners who it may not be 100% clear, can you explain the difference between um, observability and data quality? Oh, uh, yeah, so if we think about data quality, we it's all about understanding what is happening within tables, within specific columns and, and cells. So let's say data quality is about minimum maximum values in tables in specific columns. It's about uh, distribution of nulls. Uh, it's about uh, unique values. And that could be discovered only by implementing specific rules that are normally powered via SQL. So in the end of the day, those uh, scheduled SQL queries against clients, against tables in data warehouse to understand if the data looks fine. Basically, it's hunting for known unknowns. Because those rules is something you're gonna be checking for. Mm -hmm. So let's say one of our clients have this problem they are masking the uh, credit card numbers for their users, mm -hmm, sure. third parties. And they have this 
basically rules, checks, to, uh, to check those uh, mas masked uh, card numbers to ensure that the uh, length of the string is as expected. Basically to catch if masking didn't, didn't do you know, a good job. Okay. But what they are doing, they basically adding the layer of insurance and checking for known unknowns. Mm -hmm. If you think about data observability and all the things that are used in data engineering environment, like uh, VM machines, uh, data sources as uh, production data warehouses, spreadsheets. Yeah, we have to admit there are still spreadsheets as data <laughs> sources. <laughs> Third party vendors, uh, BI systems, uh, ETL systems, custom scripts, and all of those systems can just, you know, go, something can go wrong. And you don't necessarily know about it. And data observability need, uh, the, the, the goal of data observability is to ensure that every system and every pipeline is performing as expected. So let me provide you an example here. It's a couple of weeks ago, one of our clients received an error that uh, the pipeline couldn't insert JSONs. Okay. Just, you know, the JSON could be inserted in table. How bad is that error? What do you think? I mean, that seems like that's critical to building your data pipeline. Well, let's say you have 1 million records per insertion. Is it critical? Like, and, and there is some JSON couldn't be inserted, like some portion of JSONs. It seems like that would be critical to the quality of your entire pipeline, yes. Well, it's nope. moderate because, not necessarily, huh. because the retry could help. And okay. the system could do that, you know, on their own, it could handle this. Sure, it. if it can yeah. recover from it, the yeah, immediacy is not so important, perhaps. Yeah, sometimes, and, and, and systems, you know, they're not perfect either. They still build, you know, human build them as well. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And they're evolving quickly and changing all the time. Yeah. Exactly. And data is, is also uh, sort of not stable. It could change. So it's not necessarily an error. But let me give you a context. So the other day, this client received over 100 thousand offers for the same, for the same table for the same pipeline like this within one hour, over 100,000. And that table is very much a important table for the business. Why it's important? Because this company is ads bidding platform. So they generate value by using data and getting as much data of high quality in their machine learning model is of highest, of highest importance for them. Moreover, their business model is based that they basically pay money for bids from their pocket. And they get the, if they are doing great and deliver some business for their clients, they get a chunk of the revenue that they deliver for their clients. So for them, not ingesting the JSONs in that core table meant they were down. They were not generating value and they were losing, losing their own money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and there are no SQL first solution that would catch that error. Right, right. We were catching that error on a pipeline level, on a log level. And this is all about observability. Okay, Understanding if the pipelines are operating correct. The parallel that I came through recently is talking about water at your home. Data quality would be checking if the water is polluted or no, while data observability would be ensuring that all pipes at your home are not leaking, they are, <laughs> they are connected well, <laughs> there is no blockers, and also they are heading the way you expect them to head. Okay. Yeah. So seeing the whole system all exactly. the way through, instead of just the result, essentially. Yeah. That's a good analogy. I like that. Um, and does this help with things like um, 
protecting data sources? I think the obvious answer is obvious, but people are really worried about governments, privacy, things like that. In this case, you you just are completely agnostic to any of those concerns because you're not accessing the data set, right? So a co company can bring in masthead data and not be worried about impacting privacy or something like that. Am, am I understanding that correctly? Yes. Uh this is very much one of our unique differentiator because we don't care what is happening basically with your data. We just ingest logs and metadata that that ensures that there is no data breach or data leak can be connected to MassHead right. since we never access, read or edit access. But there is also, you know, when it comes to data and onboarding new solutions, normally organizations, you know, tend to, it's still a sensitive matter. Let's put it this way. As I just mentioned, everybody- As it should will, be. We want, we want yes, it to be, right? Exactly. But funny enough, uh, you know, last year uh, for all cloud users, medium and small businesses to enterprises, the shift of their concerns, like, um, sorry, so they have shifted their attention from security to the cost of the cloud. So this is first time in 10 years when businesses are more concerned about the cloud cost either than the cloud security, because like, biggest financial organizations in the world, like uh, HSB, um, the, the uh, Hong Kong Bank, right? I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correct. No, you're anyways. right, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they're using Google Cloud, which is impressive because they achieved such a great results mm -hmm. on using cloud. They can get up and running new data products in two weeks, which previously would take them six months. So cloud enabled to do, you know, and able to innovate faster to the most conservative organizations today. But that also comes with a cost. And what is also we mentioned about MassHat, since we parse in the logs and metadata, we are free, free of, um, we, we, we do not increase clients' compute cost. When we're talking about SQL first solutions, that are running scheduled SQL queries against clients' data. There is also a total cost of ownership that users need to consider because They're running utilizing SQL... that same infrastructure, right? That exactly. is also being used. Yeah, of course, makes sense. And running SQL queries is one of the most um, expensive mm -hmm. uh, cloud line, like um, uh, lines in cloud billing. And who do you give priority to, masthead or some other job? You don't want to have to do that tra trade-off either, right? In, in your case, you don't have to. But if you're, there is a tool in queue, you, in SQL, you would have to, which is never exactly. optimal either. No, it's not. And what, you know, like, there is also what I encourage users, um, not users, but, you know, data practitioners to look at is the total cost of ownership of the solutions. It's not just the price you're paying as a solution, there is also a cost on your infrastructure as well. Absolutely. So where do you run? Where is masthead data running? Um, how do you connect to the customer's environment? Maybe talk a little bit more about the deployment model. Uh, so masthead is a SaaS uh, solution. Uh, uh, the deployment takes like 15 minutes. Uh, it's very much likely, uh, not likely, but um, a li like it's almost the same as connecting any BI system. You just create a um, service account, pop sub topic and subscription, and a custom role to get, uh, and, and a custom role. And that is, you know, pretty much a usual dance for any data engineer out there. But there is also other deployment um, where we can create all of those necessary resources automatically via session-based permissions. Yeah, so it's literally frictionless. Okay, perfect. And I'm curious because everyone is interested in this topic right now, where do you see observability playing into AI strategies for organizations? Wow, that's a huge topic because- It is, <laughs> broad. <laughs> oh, 
uh, and, and, and a painful one, right? <laughs> so first of all, I am a big believer in AI because everyone wants you know, to have this vision, but I'm not sure how it's gonna change the observability space. I wanna say there are some impl like uh, applications of this, uh, of this technology, but I don't see a good application within the industry yet. We do have that layer at MassHead where we uh, let data engineers to optimize their, uh, their uh, SQL query sources to make their uh, like custom pipelines or model more efficient. In, um, uh, and uh, the angle is basically to compute less, uh, to use less compute of their environment. Because what we see when you know data engineers implement even open source solutions, very popular one, their cloud cost seems to go into the hockey stick because they're starting to play with it and they're not necessarily thinking, thinking about how that will reflect on their cloud bill. So this is a layer that we add, but I didn't see um, any, you know, sort of breakthrough application of AI yet. And was a you know, it was a grain of salt. Yeah, this is how you say it. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, it was a grain of salt. I have to say that. Um, AI been around for a while, mm -hmm. but I guess its popularity, recent popularity was uh, have to be attributed that users um, let's say less technical users had access to it mm -hmm. and Absolutely. they were able to utilize it and, you know, and get basically get fascinated with it and capabilities. And that's why it gains such a hype. The best use case that I saw so far is um, GitHub Copilot where they allow to optimize the code and, and make it, you know, the better, the best use of it. But if you think about it, they used to, to feed that large language model, they use the code that they have access to. Already basically, in GitHub, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically all around the world, people were committing code and mm -hmm. they, it was stored to their capabilities. So they had this, unfair advantage of using somebody's intellectual property, which is not okay. And that's why there is a lawsuit. The utilization and, you know, the use case is just perfect, but the ethical aspect is not there yet. And that wasn't the original intent of why people were putting code in GitHub, right? And it was not foreseen that this would come about when they when they were doing that. I never, I never looked at their... Um, terms of use and I'm not sure it was ever there that they yeah, can I don't use. know <laughs> yeah, but I, like... I certainly know as I've seen our code in companies I've worked for gang commit to github that wasn't the expectation even if maybe there's some fine print you know that's not what developers were thinking for sure and organizations as well mm -hmm. because if you think of it the uh, um, lines of code uh, intellectual property of organizations as well and they, when they were committing it to github they were never expecting it to be used in um, right. advantage for github Very, right? yeah it's a crazy world um so going back i just wanted to, as we close up i want to ask you a couple more things about masthead data um so when you come into an organization who typically brings you in is it the data engineer is it someone at the pro data project management le product management level is it a executive like who is most interested in bringing a technology like yours in for observability? Uh, so it very much depends on the organization, its structure, and its level of maturity as well. Uh, so we had use cases when data engineers were very much uh, motivated to bring us in. So it was like a bottom up approach. Uh, but it, there is also a top-down approach when uh, um, director of data platforms are engaging with us. Uh, data directors, also CTOs, are very much interested to understand what is happening with data environment sure. as well. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and we're going to drop a link into the show notes of um, a place where folks who want to learn more can um, 
come to the Masthead Data website and learn more about the technology. And it sounds like, you know, the ability to spin up Masthead Data is quite easy. Um, if, if they want to continue the conversation, do, do they engage at, um, on your website? Do you guys have a sales team as a SaaS platform? What will be the next step in talking to you? Oh, they, for sure, they can uh, check out our website. Um, yeah, I'm sure uh, I'll make sure I'll uh, share some materials with you as well. But they can also always ping me in LinkedIn. It's Yulia at Kachoa. Or they can just, uh, you know, uh, fill the request form on our website. We'll be very much happy to, to talk to you guys and, and talk about your data challenges today. That's fantastic. I really appreciate you joining the show. Um, really interesting topic. And as an early stage startup, that takes a lot of grit. And I really wish you the very best success. I think you have a great idea and um, something that's going to be really needed out there. Thank you so much, Molly. It was a pleasure talking to you today. And thank you so much for the invitation. You bet. Thanks for listening to Data Unchained, powered by Hammerspace. To learn more, visit hammerspace.com. If you have a guest you would like to hear on the show, email me at molly at hammerspace.com. Mm-hmm.